First of all, membranes, what are they? Membrane technology. It's a, um, it's a separation using a semi-permeable selective membrane. Semi-permeable describes a, a material that allows some objects, um, we typically go with molecule size, to pass through the membrane, but then uh, does not allow other objects to pass through. So the, the larger molecules will be rejected. A membrane separation process operates without heating. So other separations that you may be familiar with or you know, evaporation is really a separation of removing water and so it's drying, but they use heat and they can have an impact on product um, performance and flavors. The separation is purely physical and using a membrane enables separations to take place that would be impossible using a therm thermal separation methods. Where are we using membrane applications or where are membranes used? Um, spiral wound membranes are used um, largely in the water industry. It's an industry that we are not that involved in. Um, we do see some industrial water polishers um, at our facilities, um, but we don't deal with any of the municipalities that have these very, very large desalination units. The reason for that is they really don't clean their membranes. Um, they may clean them every six months. They may send them out to a, a third party cleaner, uh, remove all the membranes, have them cleaned and send them back. But every, you know, six months. So we don't really get too involved in that. But where we do get involved and we see most of the membrane usage um, is in the dairy industry and the whey and milk fractionation, separations, concentrations. And we'll go through that in more detail. Uh, other areas that we are involved in is the concentration of gelatin, blood plasma, corn wet milling, soy products, egg proteins. Um, another thing that we are seeing is, is more of um, plant-based proteins, pea proteins, etc. So that kind of goes along with the soy proteins. Membranes are used for beverage in juice clarification, juice co concentration. Wine is uh, using membrane a lot for um, removing kind of tannins. Um, we've seen a lot of fires out in California and that kind of have a Im flavor impact on the uh, finished product, having a smoky, smoky taste. So membranes are used for smoke, smoke removal and in beer for clarification. Um, nice cold filtered beer is actually filtered through a ceramic membrane. So I if you guys remember when that was launched. Wastewater is one of the areas we're seeing a huge amount of growth in as there is more restrictions on what can be discharged. We are seeing membranes being used in that area and they're typically called membrane bioreactors. Industrial process water is something again we're seeing more of um, just because of, of water being a, a scarce resource of um, obtaining the water coming in and um, discharge on the way out and pharmaceuticals have been using membranes for a long time in their applications, cell broth harvesting, etc. The next slide shows where membranes are used in the dairy industry. Um, this could be one, one, one plant having, you know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten membrane systems, but we have customers that have up to 17, 18, 19, maybe more membrane systems. Um, from milk intake, so anywhere you see a little box with a line through it, that's a membrane system. Um, so intake, we've got um, you know raw milk can go through a, U a UF into the cheese make, um, or raw milk can be concentrated for shipping. Um, the biggest area that we are using membranes is in, in whey, whey fractionation um, and whey concentrations, and then uh, the byproducts or the permeates, etc. Um, we are seeing membranes being used, those for recovery of water, recovery of um, lactose, etc. If you've got um, numerous membranes at your customers' facilities, just take a look and see what they're doing. Some may be very similar applications with the whey concentrations, but there might be some unique applications as well. So how did we start off with membranes? Um, really started to grow in the 1980s, where they realized that the capturing of these whey protein concentrates that could be reused for nutrition um, based <coughs> products um, was where and the development of a spiral wound membrane that was easier to make 
and the benefits of those will go through, Carl will go through those, really started the growth of the, um, of the membrane industry and the dairy industry. Ingredients advancements, where we're seeing um, whey proteins being used in various um, bakery products, milk replacers, uh, baby formulas, that kind of stuff. If you look at um, confectionery, uh, there'll be whey or whey byproducts or permeate, etc. lactose. Um, it's used in a lot of places. Uh, we started seeing a pre-concentration of milk prior to cheese vats to um, increase the throughput of those vats, so kind of a little bit of whey removal prior to uh, making the cheese. Polishing of RO permeate, rather than just sending that permeate down the drain, um, we can polish it and reuse it for CIP. We can reuse it for dye filtration, etc. And then we've seen a lot more growth because of discharge restrictions um, and, like I say, and waste treatment. That's where we start. We're seeing a lot of the growth. But a little bit about whey proteins and, and why we use them. Milk's made up with really two proteins as casein, and that really goes into the, the cheese making. And then the byproduct that was was whey that was many years ago um, fed back to the animals, spread on fields, etc. And then with the invention of the spiral wound technology, um, we saw mainstream, a lot of the, um, pretty much every dairy will have a UF membrane in there capturing those whey proteins as an added value product. Um, we even have some customers that will um, just bring in whey and process that. Um, we do have a couple of customers that have built cheese plants so they can generate their own whey. Um, we are also seeing the next generation, which is native whey, where the cheese make has, has gone away and they're just pulling out the whey proteins out of the milk without going through a cheese make. So the valuable proteins are the whey proteins there. We do have some customers that are separating up the alpha and beta lact lactoglobulin, etc. Um, but those are very specialized applications. Um, there's a variety of, of membranes that we do have available in the market, but what we typically clean is the spiral wound, and that's really what we'll be focusing on. Um, but we will mention a little bit about the other ones, and I will let Carl now jump in and um, take over. Uh, membrane technology has really taken off, um, you know, in the probably in the mid 80s, uh, by the late 80s. Um, as it started to grow, you see more uses and more uses for finished goods also brought on the more need for membranes. So they kind of fed on each other. And as they go um, through product development, you start to see more value added ingredients um, being developed um, from membrane and using membrane technology. Um, so lots and lots of uses. And that also helped uh, spur on different technologies. So Felicity talked a little bit about spiral wound. That's mainly what we see in uh, most of our plants. Uh, some of them will have uh, tubular uh, membranes, mostly in, in the uh, on the water, wastewater side with uh, that and hollow fiber. Uh, ceramics, you'll see those as well uh, out there along with plate and frame and some stainless steel type elements. They all do some of the same uh, uh, type of technology of, or regarding removing um, and splitting particles. This is kind of what they'll look like, a hollow fiber, real small type. Again, exactly what it says, some hollow fibers. Tubulars, similar, but in larger diameters where they uh, will handle larger particles. Uh, they can do backflows or cleaning is slightly different than you'd find in a normal um, spiral wound elements. Uh, the ceramics uh, primarily used in, in Europe. You don't see a whole lot of those here in the US. Um, you know, they do have an extended life. Most of those last 15, 20 years. Um, so you don't have to replace them annually, but the, uh, you can imagine the initial capital costs are pretty high. So uh, prevents uh, most people from uh, putting those in and um, they are they do have a few um, drawbacks uh, around temperature uh, changes and stainless steel you see those mostly in the industrial um, applications plate and frame uh, is another technology membrane technology 
um, early on in its development, membrane uh, plants were, were where you would see it first before the spiral wound. And when spiral wound came on, and we'll discuss the, the advantages of that, uh, membranes um, through a plate and frame kind of uh, went by the wayside, no pun intended. Lately, they've started to make a comeback uh, because of their unique um, application as far as being able to run higher viscosity and higher solids products through them without uh, without uh, having uh, plugging problems as you would with a spiral wind elements. So there's some applications where they'll use a plate and frame at the tail end or at the back end of a spiral wound plant. So not as a replacement, but just as an add-on, mostly um, in places where um, they want to raise the solids before dryer without utilizing evaporation. Spiral wound membranes is kind of what we see uh, every day out on the on, in most of our plants out there. Here you'll see a variety of different sizes from 3.8, 6, and, and 8 inch um, elements. Uh, the advantages, why, you know, why spiral wound, why not, you know, other elements? Well, um, as mentioned before, um, because of the high pack density, you can get a lot of surface area in that uh, round um, uh, shape or form, and we'll, we'll cover exactly how that, that happens. Um, the cost, I know, hey, these things are, you know, some of them are three, four hundred dollars, some of them upwards of a thousand dollars for one. It's expensive, but for the area size and the work that it can do, it's uh, relatively inexpensive. Um, you can get a lot into a, into a, not only into a housing, but also the footprint in which the whole plant resides. And they're, you know, relatively easy to replace, right? You pull the caps off, you slide what on, slide the ATD back in place and, you know, replace them. Not, not too difficult. Um, if you ever had the opportunity to take, take apart one of those plate and frames, you'll, you'll know what I'm talking about. Those things are a challenge. Uh, disadvantages. So why don't we use them for everything? Well, um, I, we just discussed they have the limitations as far as uh, the types of solids that can run through them. Uh, solids get too high or the viscosity if it gets too thick um, because of the way they're designed and the spacers, the Vexars that are used, uh, they, can, they can plug. They also have limitations because of the design of the polymers that are used and the materials. They have temperature restrictions and pressure restrictions and, and um, also uh, chemistry restrictions, right? The pH. And of course, hey, you can't run product backwards. You can't do a back flush to get some of that stuff out of there without causing damage to the membrane. So an element, what, what's inside one of these things? How, how, you know, how are they constructed? What's, um, so we'll go cover that. You can see it's pretty complicated. There's lots and lots of different materials inside one of these units. This right here is the membrane casting. Give you a better indication of kind of how that works. You saw the video there where they had the polyester backing and they called it paper, but it's not really, it's a, it's a woven polyester backing. Um, they unwind that, that backing through a um, trough area that has a casting blade and poly polyester polymer dopes that are special mixtures depending upon the type of element you're making, um, both whether it's a, a you know, UF or RO or an MF and the molecular weight that you're looking for, they'll make modifications to the polymers, they'll make modifications to the application process right along with the speed and at which it, it flows and runs, all of those will have an impact on the molecular weight of that particular element. Those uh, polymer um, recipes, if you will, are um, highly um, guarded by each, uh, each of the different membrane manufacturers. They all have their own special recipes that they use, uh, different formulations. And uh, most of that doesn't uh, doesn't get out. So as it falls into that bath, it's important to notice what that bath does. Essentially, take the solvents that hold the polymers into a liquid and remove that out, and allow the polymers to stay adhere right onto that polyester backing. So it gives you an idea what that bath does. Then taking a cross section of that of that backing, 
You can see uh, the picture here, mostly on the right hand side, that thin white layer on the very top of that picture. That is in reference the uh, actual polymer, the, or the polymers or the membrane that does all the work. The rest of it, that larger piece that has the crevices in, that's the backing. See the crevices are a little smaller at the top and then get larger as it goes towards the bottom or the back side of the element, allowing product uh, to permeate through very, very quickly and not have a lot of back pressure. So in relative thickness that uh, the polymer uh, membrane area is very, very thin. Here's a looking at uh, the membrane on, on the surface. As if you look at it very, very closely, you'll notice hey, it's relatively fairly smooth. It's not you know, rough, it's fairly smooth, and that helps ensure uh, cleanliness. Also, you can see the little dark spots. Those are the perforations in the top of the element. And you'll notice here that they're all not all exactly the same size. So it's not like a mechanical um, perforation where each um, each uh, pore is identical in size. Uh, they are they do vary in size. Some a little smaller, some a little bigger, and they all average into that your molecular weight. Now talk about the holes. This gives you an indication of pore distribution. So when I mentioned earlier, some holes are a little bigger, some holes are a little smaller. What you're trying to do is ensure that you've got a tighter distribution as possible. So you want to try to get those hole sizes um, based on your formulation and your application and the way you run your equipment to tighten up those uh, the pore distribution. Uh, some manufacturers are a little better at it than others. Um, um, and then um, some uh, molecular weight products will also have wider distribution. Now, once you've established um, you know, your, your um, membrane and what you're trying to make, uh, depending upon what that is, you'll have various pore, pore sizes. Um, here on the left-hand side, you'll take a look at the different types of, of um, materials we're trying to separate out in within the dairy world. Uh, the largest of the molecules is bacteria. Followed by that, and you can see that in the blue, and the, the next one is fats. And then you get into proteins and caseins, a little bit smaller, it's a little smaller than that, will be the your lactose, sugar. And then a little smaller than that would be your minerals, your calcium, magnesiums, that sort of thing. And of course, the smallest one is water. You know, on your right hand side will dictate the type of elements and kind of what they do. So the tightest of them all is our RO element was essentially will reject everything but water. So we use those up front just to again to um, you'll see them in water polishers to concentrate water, hold back all of those other components that might be in that and create polished water. You'll see in an RO system in order again to concentrate uh, both minerals and lactose. Then you'll have an NF system where somebody's trying to remove minerals. Some people want to take out the calcium and hold back lactose and what have you. So then you'll use an NF for that. UF ultrafiltration um, pretty much lets lactose through and you'll, you will use those to essentially concentrate and hold back proteins and some caseins and fats. And then we use an MF system on the back end to make mostly the MPIs and WPIs, where after you removed all the lactose and minerals through, you essentially have a protein. And in order to concentrate proteins up, you need to be able to take something out. And what you'll take out is fat. And we use an MF uh, to do that. Um, there are some MFs that were, uh, some people are putting into place in order to, um, to hold back and, and process uh, caseins. Now, when we talked about ROs and NFs and UFs, and uh, it's good to know that each one has different molecular weights. So you can have an NF or an RO with various um, element sizes. So for instance, here you can see um, then NF will have a molecular weight of somewhere between 100 to 900 uh, Daltons. A Dalton is, a, is the um, terminology used for measuring um, membranes. A UF will have somewhere between 1,000 to somewhere around 70,000 molecular weight in their cutoff. And an MF will be somewhere between 80,000 80, to uh, say a 0.2 micron or so 
up up in that size. So those are kind of how they divide up membrane um, membrane types when we decide, um, hey, is this a UF or um, an RO or an NF? Molecular weight helps us do that. And also you can have a UF with various uh, molecular weights and you'll see those in, in facilities. So it's important to know that um, when um, people are especially replacing membranes, you can have various sizes within the same system. Um, here's a little graphical uh, representation of uh, UF. You can see that allowing the water to pass and minerals and, and some lactose and, and then rejecting, of course, the, the fats and the proteins and bacteria. During membrane application, I think we talked a little bit about this. Um, again, using water mostly to reject uh, water um, and then concentrate just about everything else using an NF or UF or um, UO, some people call it a ultra osmosis, but to NF and uh, nanofiltration. Um, again, mainly to remove minerals, salts, calciums out of there. A UF for removing lactose and concentrating uh, proteins. And then an MF, I think we talked about that um, on the back end for both uh, milk plants and, and um, uh, protein plants in order to reject fat and concentrate up um, proteins. So once you've got the um, the uh, element decided, hey, I've got you know we're going to make a UF at a you know 10,000 10, or 10k molecular weight cutoff. You've got to figure out what what space are you. You probably saw the the person in there who had the element, um, and they were cutting that those mesh spacers. Now mesh spacers. And we'll have just like elements, we'll have different sizes as well. And you can see here on the top left hand diagram, you've got the spacer sizes. Um, and they'll this one here have, happens to show four of them, a 31 mil spacer, a 46 mil spacer, a 65, and then an 80 mil spacer. So each one just a little bit thicker than the previous one. And um, you can see on the chart here, they've laid out um, the types of solids that are appropriate to run through that particular spacer. So as your solids start to increase, you, you need, because of the higher solids and the higher viscosity, you need to increase the size of that spacer in order to maintain a pressure differential so you don't end up uh, squeezing out or moving that, that spacer um, outside of that element. Now in spacer design, um, there's a couple of different designs here. You can see the the um, the parallel spacer down at the bottom, and then the um, diamond net spacer on the top right hand. That's typically what you see out in the in the in these spiral wounds in um, most of the elements that you happen to have the opportunity to open up and look inside and and visually see. They'll look like that. This one happens to be an 80 mil spacer. Um, they essentially serve two purposes. The first one again, pretty obvious, right? Hey, it's a spacer. It keeps the membrane apart and allows uh, product or water to flow through it. Um, but also, it has a secondary purpose in its design. So you see that crosshatch design. Well, that crosshatch is important to help generate um, uh, turbulence, and that turbulence is important to help um, during production to wipe off or keep the surface of the element clean. And so if any if the product starts to build up or lay on that surface, if you get turbulent flow, you get that product going bobbing. You can imagine as it flows through there, it's bobbing up and down and uh, you know left and right. And that helps uh, break up or keep that surface of the element clean. Without it, uh, over time, the um, you'd start to see channels and you'd start to see the elements start to uh, start to foul much, much quicker than you would otherwise. Now looking at a side view of that, you can see the 31 mil spacer. You can see uh, notice how much um, narrower those channels are. You can see then the next one is a 46 it opened up just a little bit more and a little more as you travel through up to the 80 mil spacer. Um, as we mentioned earlier, the um, object of going with a higher mill spacer is to allow thicker and more higher solids products to flow through without um, um, maintaining too high of a back pressure, if you will. 
Um, also, something to remember is, hey, if I put in more spacer, uh, that means I have to take something else out. Remember the outside diameter, you can't change, right? It's the diameter of the pipe that this thing, the housing that it's going to fit in. So if you add more or thicker spacer, that means you're going to have to lessen the amount of available surface area. So um, the, those leaves you saw the, the person lay out will then have to be shorter or they'll have to be less of them. So um, just a, something to keep in mind when uh, choosing an element size. And now though, once we picked out and we decided what, uh, what spacer we're going to use based upon the type of product we're going to run in this particular application, then we're looking at uh, constructing or putting the element together. Uh, you remember they took the sheet, they pulled it across the table and they took the spacer. And that's a little gray area, the feed spacer of XR that we just picked. We said, okay, we're going to lay that down in the middle and then they cut that sheet twice, twice the length. And then they're going to fold it over and the, they put that on the side of the membrane. So the mem remember there was a backing side and then there was the polymer side. The polymer side happens to be what's up against the, that mesh. So they'll fold that over. Boom, just like that. And then they'll continue to make more of those. OK, once they make a bunch of those, then the, the guy had the feed tube. You probably saw that he had a big feed tube and then that tube, they'll take the permeate carrier. So the carrier is a, looks a little bit like the mesh that we looked at the Vexar mesh, except it's super fine um, a screen that kind of maybe resembles the, your, the window screen that you have at home um, out on your windows, but much, much um, thinner and much, much smaller. And they'll take those permeates um, carrier and they'll affix it to that tube. And then they'll apply glue. They'll take a, a, an epoxy glue and they'll lay it right across the bottom of that. And then they'll take the packet that you just saw us fold and they'll lay that in there with the folded end, the end that was folded up against the tube and then the end that's open up on the outer side. And then they'll apply glue to the other end and then fold it. Just like that, fold that one over and then they'll lay another one on top. Just like that and they'll continue the process until they have as many as they want. Now the the amount that they put in and the length of those again is determined by the um, outside housing diameter, right? How much um, membrane surface I can fit within that housing. And this kind of shows a little bit of that. And then the element is wound on the tube there. Now, um, to get this gives you an indication a little bit of how that the, how the system works. Now, um, taking that me membrane and unwinding it and looking at it, you can see the feed material um, doesn't flow around the outside of the housing. It actually flows through those channels. So product will come in the, the inside of that channel. It will flow right across that, that mesh diamond spacer we just looked at earlier. It goes out the backside. And as it's traveling through there, uh, the permeate will then the lower molecular weight product will flow through the membrane surface into that channel that the, the, the permeate spacer uh, had and it'll flow down that channel until it reaches that permeate tube and come out of those holes into that uh, and then out the end of the, the uh, vessel. Looking at it from the cross end, if you took that you can see the green area. The green area is the feed spacer. That white area is the membrane, and then that goldish brown area is the carrier. You can see product will float across that feed spacer, and then the permeate. Those little, I don't know, purplish arrows. You can see permeate permeating through, going into the that channel, um, and then working its way to the center of the tube. This kind of shows you a little better then maybe I can explain it. See so product flowing in and then permeate flowing out of that center tube. Product flows through and then the permeate goes through the wall into that 
permeate channel and then coming out of the tube through those holes. I do encourage that if you have some customers that are taking out membrane and going to throw them in the trash to just cut open an element and find all those um, components that make up the spiral wound membrane. You'll see the mesh outer wrap um, and then you once you unwind it, you'll see kind of the shiny surface of the membrane and around the edge of the leaf, you'll see the glue line and then you'll also see the mesh feed spacer. But if you are then able to slice the membrane surface open, um, you'll get to the back side of the membrane and you'll see kind of the papery material that um, Carl was discussing and how that gets cast and the membrane gets adhered to that backing material. And then in between the layers of the two membranes that are glued together, the back side and the front side, you'll see the permeate carrier. And if you are able to unwind the membrane and follow that permeate carrier all the way to that center perforated tube. Um, you'll find the, um, the the fold that um, he was describing and you'll also see where that permeate carrier was attached. So the membrane um, does the separation. The permeate goes through one layer of membrane and one layer only. Um, it doesn't filter all the way through those layers to the central tube. It filters through, it's separated. And the reason that it doesn't come back out is because we have, we apply pressure on the driving force side of the membrane for that separation to take place. So that's called reverse osmosis. So we have to have an applied pressure for those small molecules to pass through the membrane. If we didn't have pressure, you would basically have no separation. The molecules would take a path of least resistance, which is not through a membrane. It takes energy to go through the membrane. So what I'm going to describe now is just a little bit of what osmosis is. And then what we talk about is reverse osmosis and reverse osmosis is the principles of membrane separation. So osmosis is basically um, happens in nature. It's a movement of a solvent through a semi-permeable membrane into a solution of higher a solution of higher solute concentration that tends to equalize the concentration of the solute on the two sides of the membrane. Well, what does that really mean? And I'll explain that. That's the Google version or the Wikipedia version. So basically, it's a process in which plants and animal cells transports liquids and nutrients through their cell walls. Um, what we've got here and what you can see is basically it's a beaker and the beaker is divided into two halves and the orange section is our semi permeable membrane. So this is a reverse osmosis membrane. It will only, only allow water molecules to pass through. Um, on one side, the dark blue side, which is on the right side, I have a salt solution. So it's kind of concentrated solution with salt in it. And on the left side, the lighter blue color is just water. And if we were to leave that beaker sit on the counter, we would see the level of the dilute water decrease and the level on the side of the concentrate solution increase. So what we're seeing is that we're seeing water molecules physically pass through the semi-permeable membrane to try and dilute that concentrated side. It's trying to create an equilibrium. It's trying to make sure that everything is equal, which is kind of what happens in Mother Nature. This is how we see water able to get from a plant or a tree's root system in the ground where there's abundance of water and they're able to transfer through cells and the semi-permeable membrane up to the branches and the leaves and the fruit that's on the trees. We see that movement up. That's what happens in nature. If we were in an area with no gravity, we would see that whole um, side of the, of the dilute side disperse all the way through to the other side. But what we have on the ground here is we have gravity force pushing on that um, concentrate side. So there'll be a point where that, that movement stops. If you want to go online and take a look at just what is osmosis, there's lots of um, great little diagrams, etc., that you can see, probably some videos, etc. Now what we're doing is we're doing reverse osmosis. So we want the opposite. 
basically what we're doing is we're taking a solution that's got nutrition nutrients in it components in it and we're going to force it the opposite way through that membrane and we're going to remove some of the smaller molecules now depending on our process the either the concentrated solution will be our finished product whey protein concentrates milks etc or we want the permeate side to be our finished product for example when we're purifying water so depending on what we're trying to process will determine whether we want the permeate which goes through the membrane or the concentrate or retentate so stuff that is retained molecules that are too large to go through so what we've got now is we've got a pressure forcing through those molecules now the pressure has to be over and above the osmotic pressure of our solution now you can google osmotic pressure of milk of whey of seawater etc that driving force has to be over and above the pressure uh, the osmotic pressure of the solution otherwise we're not going to have a separation take place it will just be status quo nothing will happen now my example here is i always talk about going on a cruise ship and um if you didn't know those cruise ships have a ton of reverse osmosis membranes in probably in the engine room or somewhere they're taking seawater and they're pushing it through these membranes to turn it into usable water for showers and uh, maybe probably drinking etc turning it into ice cubes so you know carl that's on his cruise can have an ice cube in his cocktail we need the pressure to force force that through so we need a bunch of pumps um, on a membrane system you'll see there's just a bunch of pumps and that's what's creating that driving force now the other thing to think about is if we moved from a regular ocean and we moved to the dead sea we started trying to process the dead sea water we probably wouldn't have much success because we didn't have enough pump energy the dead sea has got a ton of salt in it the osmotic pressure of the dead sea water is incredibly high so we would need to bring in some more pumps to force that those water molecules through out of the dead sea water when we look at this we need to understand what that pressure is that's driving force we will refer to that as baseline baseline pressure as you get more concentrated your osmotic pressure increases and then it's harder for us to separate the, the molecules so if you can see now what we're doing is we're applying the driving pressure forcing those water molecules through and we end up with our container full of um, water for Carl's cocktails and ice. If you can note here the difference pressures, the microfiltration membrane has very large pore structure. It's fairly easy for those molecules to pass through, but we still need some driving pressure to force those through. So we're, we're very low at five, possibly 30 PSI. And as the membrane um, tightens, you can see that we're going to need some more pressure to force those molecules through the membrane um, with the RO membranes being the highest pressure. Um, you guys as well, if you a handy hint here, if you don't, if you're looking at a membrane system, which is a bunch of tanks, pipes, pumps and valves, and you don't know if it's an RO unit or a UF, you can determine if it's a UF membrane or an MF membrane if it's got low pressure clamps on it. The RO membranes will never and the nano filtration membranes will have never have low pressure clamps just because of the driving force that's being used. So that's just a handy hint for you. Yep, that's yeah, one of the first things to look at. Second, you can take a look at the number of pumps on the feed side. You see the, the pump yep. and the pump style. Um, if you have any questions that come up, just reach out to us.